Today we are talking about Abraham Lincoln. He was the 16th President of the United States. Many Americans consider him one of the country's greatest leaders. Yet people alive when Lincoln was elected in 1860 would probably be surprised by modern-day opinions about him. He had little formal education or government experience. During the presidential campaign, critics made fun of his appearance and his simple way of talking. They warned that he was not very intelligent and would harm the nation's image. Some of his opponents, especially in southern states, had even bigger concerns. They were afraid Lincoln would use the power of the federal government to end slavery in their states. They were right. Abraham Lincoln was born in the frontier state of Kentucky. His family was very poor and had a simple home, a log cabin. Lincoln had to support his parents and his sister by working, so he rarely went to school. Instead, he taught himself by reading books. Eventually, he became a lawyer in the state of Illinois. As a young man, Lincoln was known for several qualities. He was tall and thin. He was very strong. His neighbors remembered him cutting down trees. And he was honest. The people he defended in court called him Honest Abe. In time, Lincoln was elected to the Illinois General Assembly, the state's legislature. He also served one term as a congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives. But he was not popular there. Voters did not like his opposition to the country's war with Mexico. So Lincoln withdrew from politics and turned his attention to his family. He had married a Southern belle named Mary Todd in 1842. They had four sons but two died when they were very young. Lincoln also developed his legal career representing railroad companies. Some people thought he might become the best railroad lawyer in the country, but that is not what happened. <laughs> In the 1850s, Lincoln returned to national politics. The division over the issue of slavery was deepening. Lincoln was not an anti-slavery activist, an abolitionist, but he did not support the country's policies on slavery. Lincoln believed slavery violated the American Declaration of Independence, which said all men had the right to life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To be clear, Lincoln did not believe that black people should have the same rights as white U.S. citizens. But he did not agree that one person should own other people or profit from their work while they earned nothing and were held captive. Lincoln decided to compete in elections for a seat in the U.S. Senate. He was chosen as the candidate of a new anti-slavery party. Members called themselves Republicans. During the election campaign, Lincoln famously discussed the issue of slavery in a series of debates with Stephen Douglas, the Democratic Party's candidate. Lincoln's words moved some voters, but they did not earn him enough votes to get elected. So, while Douglas took the seat in the Senate, Lincoln prepared to run for president. Lincoln said that, if he were elected, he would not expand slavery to new territories in the country's west. 
but he promised not to interfere with slavery in the southern states, where it already existed. Voters in southern slaveholding states did not trust Lincoln. Not a single southern state supported him in the election of 1860. But he won anyway. The support of anti-slavery northerners gave him the presidency. In answer, seven southern states withdrew from the Union. Four more later joined them. These states formed a new government called the Confederate States of America, or the Confederacy. Confederate officials chose their own president and wrote their own constitution, which permitted each state control over its own laws, especially laws that protected slavery. Confederate officials said they no longer recognized the power of the U.S. federal government or its chief executive. As that chief executive, Lincoln would have to decide what to do. President Lincoln's first test came a little more than a month after he was sworn in. The event involved Fort Sumter, a federal military base on an island off the coast of South Carolina. Soldiers on the base needed food. Lincoln said he would send some by ship. But Confederate officials considered the port part of South Carolina which belonged to the Confederacy. They demanded that the Union soldiers leave the fort. But Union forces and the U.S. President ignored the Confederates' demands. As promised, Lincoln sent the supply ships. As expected, Confederate soldiers attacked. A day and a half later, the fort's Union soldiers surrendered. The clash did not last long, and no one was killed in the fighting. But the battle at Fort Sumter marked the official beginning of hostilities between the Union and the Confederacy. Lincoln immediately took action to answer the loss at Fort Sumter. He called on state militias for troops and asked for a special meeting of Congress. The President was careful not to ask Congress to make an official declaration of war, in part because he did not want to recognize the Confederacy as a separate nation. Instead, he called the Southern states' opposition a rebellion. However, the conflict between the Southern Confederacy and the Northern Union was a civil war. Neither side expected the fighting to last very long, a few weeks or maybe months. Instead, the Civil War lasted four and a half years. Most of the major battles took place near Washington, D.C., in the states of Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Soldiers and civilians also clashed in the West, in Tennessee, as well as in the southern states of Mississippi, South Carolina, and Georgia. But the war involved the entire country. At least four million men fought in it. Among the soldiers were African American and Native American men. The conflict divided families. Brothers, fathers, and sons fought against each other. Women in both the North and South also supported the war effort. They cooked meals, made and repaired clothing for the troops, served as nurses, and cared for the soldiers. Both white and African-American women also took over the work of men who had left to fight. 
and more than 620,000 men died. Recent scholarship says as many as 750,000. The Civil War remains the bloodiest war in American history. And it changed the country. The war radically affected American politics, economics, and society. Abraham Lincoln was the U.S. president through all of it. He led the United States during the Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865. In that conflict, the Southern Confederacy battled the Union, the states that supported the federal government. Southern states wanted to make their own laws, including those that protected slavery. They were afraid that President Lincoln would use the power of the federal government to ban slavery in their states, as well as in other areas. So 11 southern states withdrew from the rest of the country. They stopped recognizing the power of the central government. President Lincoln did not think states had the right to withdraw. He said he was fighting to reunite the country. But in time, he accepted that the Civil War would also be a fight to end slavery. Lincoln is known for several qualities as a wartime president. One was how he led the military campaign. As president, Lincoln worked with top military officials to create a plan. They realized that the Union had more resources and more men who could fight than the Confederate forces. So they planned to surround the southern states, cut off their supplies, and prevent foreign powers from helping the Confederacy. Lincoln hoped the Union's generals could execute the plan quickly and end the war as soon as possible. But the generals were guarded. They did not want to harm their soldiers if they did not have to. They also knew the Confederacy had a skilled commander in General Robert E. Lee. Troops under another Confederate general, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, also defeated the Union Army in several early battles. Lincoln was frustrated with the war effort. He wanted generals who would not only win battles, but chase after the opposing forces and destroy them so they could not fight again. In one famous telegram, he wrote to his top general, George McClellan. Lincoln said, If General McClellan does not want to use the army, I would like to borrow it for a time. Finally, Lincoln replaced McClellan. Then he replaced McClellan's replacements. Lincoln changed the presidency by being actively involved as a commander-in-chief of the military. He also greatly expanded the powers of the chief executive. Lincoln believed that, during war, the president had powers that were greater than those of Congress and the Supreme Court. As a result, he took many actions that critics, and even some supporters, considered illegal under the U.S. Constitution. For example, Lincoln spent millions of dollars in federal money without getting permission from Congress. He also limited freedom of the press, restricted mail service, and declared martial law in some places, even when the situation did not require military action. Most notably, Lincoln temporarily suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is an important right in the American legal tradition. 
It means that people who are under arrest have the right to appear personally in court. But at some periods, Lincoln ignored that right. He said the Confederacy's rebellion justified his actions. And he said extreme measures were necessary to reunite the country. One of Lincoln's most important legacies relates to slavery. The issue was at the heart of the American Civil War. For most of his career, Lincoln spoke against slavery, but he did not try to bar the custom in states where it already existed. He agreed to leave slavery in the South alone. Lincoln also did not really believe in racial equality, and he worried that if slavery ended in the United States, blacks and whites would not be able to live peacefully together. But as the war continued, Lincoln changed his mind about how to deal with the issue. For one thing, anti-slavery activists were urging Lincoln to end slavery for moral reasons. Lincoln also considered tactical reasons, those related to the war. He saw that enslaved people in the South were escaping to join Union armies in the North. Their actions helped the Union effort. Lincoln also wanted to prevent England or France from helping the South. The Southern states were important trading partners for Europe, but the English and French people had rejected slavery. Lincoln hoped that if the Union also rejected slavery, European countries would support the North, or at least not support the South. So Lincoln waited until the Union won a major battle in Antietam, Maryland. Then he announced that he was using his power as a wartime president to order the end of slavery in the Confederate States. He produced a document called the Emancipation Proclamation. It said that enslaved people in the rebelling states were forever free. Historians note that the act was important and revolutionary, but it was mostly symbolic. The federal government was not able to enforce the order at the time, and it did not deal with enslaved people in other areas. But the Emancipation Proclamation was the beginning of the end of legal slavery in the country. During the rest of his presidency, Lincoln worked in support of an anti-slavery amendment to the Constitution. That amendment, the 13th, was approved in 1865. It officially outlawed slavery across the country. He led the United States during the Civil War. That conflict lasted from 1861 to 1865. In it, the southern states of the Confederacy battled the northern states of the Union. As a wartime president, Lincoln was known for several things. He was actively involved in plotting the military campaign. When Lincoln was unhappy with the performance of his top generals, he dismissed them. He also greatly increased the power of the presidency, even beyond what the U.S. Constitution permitted. And Lincoln struck at the issue at the heart of the Civil War, slavery. He ordered that enslaved people in the Confederate States be forever free. His order is called the Emancipation Proclamation. Seven months after the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, the Confederacy and the Union 
clashed in the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. The Army of Confederate General Robert E. Lee was on the offensive. Lee planned to move the fighting out of the South and invade the North. He won a major victory against Union forces at Chancellorsville, Virginia. Then he pushed across Maryland and into Pennsylvania. A Union army, led by General George Meade, met Lee's troops near a small crossroads town called Gettysburg. In the first days of July 1863, a little more than two years after the start of the Civil War, Confederate and Union troops each struggled to claim the territory. Both sides suffered massive casualties. But Lee believed Confederate troops were close to winning and that Meade had spread his soldiers thin. So, on the third day of fighting, he ordered a direct attack on Union forces. Lee's soldiers aimed at the center of the Union line, positioned behind stone walls at the top of a ridge, or raised area. Confederates first used cannons to fire artillery at the ridge. Then about 15,000 Confederate soldiers began marching across more than a kilometer of an open field. The Union soldiers behind the walls fired on them. More Union forces attacked the Confederate soldiers on the left and right. In half an hour, three-quarters of the soldiers in the open field had been killed or wounded. Thousands more on each side also died. The surviving Confederate forces quickly withdrew and waited for Meade to attack again. But, much to Lincoln's dissatisfaction, he did not. The following morning, Lee led the survivors back to Virginia. He left behind 28,000 soldiers dead, wounded, or missing, more than one-third of his total army. The Union had suffered 23,000 casualties, almost as many. The Battle of Gettysburg is important in American history for several reasons. One is the large number of killed and wounded soldiers, the largest until World War II in the 20th century. Another reason is because it was a turning point in the war. It ended Lee's invasion of the North and weakened his army permanently. Over the same days, Union troops won another major victory under General Ulysses S. Grant in the southern city of Vicksburg, Mississippi. The battles at Vicksburg and Gettysburg began to turn the conflict to the Union's favor. Finally, the Battle of Gettysburg is almost always linked to a speech Lincoln gave there, known as the Gettysburg Address. It is only about 270 words long, but it is one of the most famous speeches in American history. Lincoln spoke at the opening of a cemetery for all the soldiers who had died at Gettysburg, but he also used the event to speak to the entire country about the war. He said, The conflict was a test of whether the American form of government could survive that is, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. He also pointed to the Declaration of Independence as the country's founding document. He said, The nation had been conceived in liberty, and, he said, it was dedicated to the idea that all men are created equal. Historians have noted that, in the speech, Lincoln changed the reasoning behind the war effort. It continued to be a struggle to reunite the country. But after the Gettysburg Address, it was also more clearly a struggle 
to free enslaved people. In 1864, Lincoln won re-election to a second term as president. His new vice president was Senator Andrew Johnson from the southern state of Tennessee. At the swearing-in ceremony, the president spoke about the need for the North and South to come together again peacefully. In that speech, his famous second inaugural, Lincoln called on all Americans to finish the war. He urged them to care for the wounded, the wives and children of soldiers killed in battle, and to seek a just and lasting peace. Most importantly, Lincoln asked Americans to reunite with malice toward none, with charity for all. In other words, with respect and kindness. A few weeks later, the war effectively ended. Lincoln's military plan had worked. He had finally found two generals whom he trusted, Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman. Sherman led a campaign across the southern states. His path through Georgia, from the city of Atlanta to the city of Savannah, was known as Sherman's March to the Sea. The march destroyed farms and houses along the way. The destruction was terrible. It was also effective. The Confederate Army was left with little food or communication. At the same time, Grant surrounded Lee's army in Virginia. Grant cut these Southern troops off from supplies, too. Lee realized he must surrender to Grant, although, he said, he would rather die a thousand deaths. The two men met on April 9, 1865, at a farmhouse in the town of Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. Lee famously wore his finest military uniform and sword. Grant famously wore his fighting clothes, still marked with mud. Lee and Grant spoke briefly. Then Grant wrote the terms of surrender. As Lincoln had asked, the terms were respectful and generous. Lee's officers were free to keep their horses and their weapons, and the Union Army would give the Confederate soldiers food. When some Union troops began to play a victory song, Grant told them to stop. The war is over, he said. The rebels are our countrymen again. Five days after Lee surrendered, Lincoln and his wife, Mary, went to a theater in Washington, D.C. To put it mildly, the last years had been very difficult for them. While Lincoln was supervising the war effort, both his third and fourth son became sick with typhoid. The younger boy recovered. The older did not. Willie Lincoln died in the White House at age 11. Mary and Abraham Lincoln were crushed. Mary Lincoln blamed herself. She believed God was punishing her. In their own ways, the Lincolns continued to mourn in the years after Willie's death. At one point, Lincoln said he hoped he and Mary could feel happier. He urged them to have some pleasant times together. So, with the war coming to an end, they went to a light-hearted play at Ford's Theater. It was the night of Friday, April 14, 1865, a day that Christians were marking that year as Good Friday, the anniversary of Jesus' death. The theater was not far from the White House. The Lincolns had seats in a box high above the stage. Toward the end of the performance, a man entered their box and shot 
Abraham Lincoln, in the back of the head. Then the gunman jumped to the stage, breaking his leg as he landed. He called out a Latin expression, Sic semper tyrannis. It means, thus always to tyrants. Some observers say, the man added, the South is avenged. The gunman was a Southerner named John Wilkes Booth. He had plotted to kill the president after hearing Lincoln support voting rights for African Americans. Booth briefly escaped, but was later captured and hanged. Lincoln was taken to a nearby boarding house. He seemed lifeless and could hardly breathe. Doctors examined him, but found they could not save him. Lincoln died the following morning. He was 56 years old. The emotions of many Americans changed from joy at the coming end of the Civil War to shock and mourning. Thousands lined up along railroad tracks as Lincoln's body made its way from Washington, D.C. to his home in Illinois. Even many Southerners mourned Lincoln's death. They understood that he would treat them kindly. A little more than six weeks after Lincoln's assassination, the last Confederate army surrendered, and the war was considered officially over. The country was reunited, and the process of legally freeing enslaved people had begun. Although these acts are tremendous parts of Lincoln's legacy, in time his public image would grow only larger and more celebrated. As one witness to Lincoln's death reportedly said, now he belongs to the ages. During the election campaign, Lincoln famously discussed the issue of slavery in a series of debates with Stephen Douglas, the Democratic Party's candidate. Lincoln's words moved some voters, but they did not earn him enough votes to get elected. So, while Douglas took the seat in the Senate, Lincoln prepared to run for president. Lincoln said that, if he were elected, he would not expand slavery to new territories in the country's west. But he promised not to interfere with slavery in the southern states, where it already existed. Voters in southern slaveholding states did not trust Lincoln. Not a single southern state supported him in the election of 1860 but he won anyway. The support of anti-slavery Northerners turned to national politics. The division over the issue of slavery was deepening. Lincoln was not an anti-slavery activist, an abolitionist, but he did not support the country's policies on slavery. Lincoln believed slavery violated the American Declaration of Independence which said all men had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To be clear, Lincoln did not believe that black people should have the same rights as white U.S. citizens. But he did not agree that one person should own other people or profit from their work while they earned nothing and were held captive. Lincoln decided to compete in elections for a seat in the U.S. Senate. He was chosen as the candidate of a new anti-slavery party. Members called themselves Republic, the state's legislature. He also served one term as a congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives. But he was not popular there. Voters did not like his opposition to the country's war with Mexico. So Lincoln withdrew from politics and turned his attention to his family. 
He had married a southern belle named Mary Todd in 1842. They had four sons, but two died when they were very young. Lincoln also developed his legal career representing railroad companies. Some people thought he might become the best railroad lawyer in the country, but that is not what happened. In the 1850s, Lincoln returned. Today we are talking about Abraham Lincoln. He was the 16th President of the United States. Many Americans consider him one of the country's greatest leaders. Yet people alive when Lincoln was elected in 1860 would probably be surprised by modern-day opinions about him. He had little formal education or government experience. During the presidential campaign, critics made fun of his appearance and his simple way of talking. They warned that he was not very intelligent and would harm the nation's image. Some of his opponents, especially in southern states, had even bigger concerns. They were afraid Lincoln would use the power of the federal government to end slavery in their states. They were right. Abraham Lincoln was born in the frontier state of Kentucky. His family was very poor and had a simple home, a log cabin. Lincoln had to support his parents and his sister by working, so he rarely went to school. Instead, he taught himself by reading books. Eventually, he became a lawyer in the state of Illinois. As a young man, Lincoln was known for several qualities. He was tall and thin. He was very strong. His neighbors remembered him cutting down trees. And he was honest. The people he defended in court called him Honest Abe. In time, Lincoln was elected to the Illinois General Assembly. 